Session 6, Eliminating Negative Emotions. Continuing on the subject of responsibility versus irresponsibility, many years ago, back in 1972, I began a study in an area of metaphysics that dealt with the psychology of the evolution of human potential. And one of the things that leaped out of those pages at me, and I've never really have recovered from it, was the discussion of the connecting link between irresponsibility and negative emotions. And the fact that negative emotions are the great blocking emotions or crippling emotions of your life and my life. If the whole purpose of life, if you like, is to achieve higher levels of peace of mind, happiness, contentment, satisfaction, and so on, we have to sit down and we have to look and say, what stops us, or what is blocking us, or what gets in the way of us really enjoying our lives? And you find invariably it's negative emotions of some kind. Now, I'm not talking about the negative emotions that are associated with someone dying or with a great loss. I'm talking about the negative emotions that we experience on a day-to-day -day basis that rob us of peace of mind, rob us of health and energy, affect our loving relationships, get in the way of our financial independence, rob us of a feeling of fulfillment, and so on. So we're going to talk in this session about eliminating negative emotions, and I want to bring us back to this whole discussion of responsibility. This is one of the most important things that I've ever found in my life. It's simply this, is that if we take a graph or chart, and come with me for a second and let's chart this, and we take from the highest to the lowest, and here we have a totally responsible person. This is a person who is completely self-assured, completely self-responsible, makes no excuses at all, and down here at the other end we have an irresponsible person, a person who makes excuses for everything. Now, this is the positive end of the scale, this is the negative end of the scale. Every one of us, you and I, are somewhere on this scale moving up or down with every decision that we take. Now, we've found, and this is what got to me, and I said a little bit earlier, that there's a one-to-one -one relationship between how much you feel you are in control of your own life and how positive or how happy you are. Well, there's a one-to-one -one relationship between the amount of responsibility you accept and the amount of control you experience in your life. And there's a one-to-one -one relationship between the amount of responsibility and control you accept and the amount of freedom that you feel that you have. Freedom is the indispensable requirement for happiness. That true success, true happiness in life means being free to live your life your own way as you decide without anybody else telling you what to do. Living your life as a bird, free as a bird, to do whatever you want. Well, there's a direct relationship between responsibility, control, and freedom, and there's a direct relationship between these three and positive emotions. Now, positive emotions are the great emotions. Positive emotions are those of happiness and love and joy and vitality and energy and exuberance and enthusiasm and excitement and so on. Now, down at the other end, however, we have an attitude of irresponsibility. And what does that lead to? This is what shocked me so much when I first learned it. It leads to a lack of control. Is that to the degree to which we are irresponsible, we lose control. Our inner selves disintegrate and fragment. It also leads to a lack of freedom because we no longer see ourselves as free agents choosing the direction of our own lives. We see ourselves as pawns, as victims, if you like, of external forces. And a lack of control and freedom leads to negative emotions. When I first began to understand this, I thought, well, yeah, but what about uh, my parents, and what about my childhood, and what about my condition? I didn't have a very good job, and what about my friends? I had crummy friends, and what about my health, and what about uh, the weather, and what about the economy? When I began to realize this, as I began to realize that you put all that aside, if your highest aim, your highest goal is positive emotions of happiness, joy, freedom, enthusiasm, and so on, then you have to stop making excuses. Now, Carl Menninger the uh, great psychoanalyst said a very interesting thing some years ago. He said that physical ailments are all different, caused by different bacteria, different viruses, and so on. He said, but mental illness is the same illness simply spread along a spectrum from the least to the worst. And Thomas Saz, the psychiatrist, said in his book, The Myth of Mental Illness, that there is no such thing as mental illness. There are merely varying degrees of irresponsibility. So when we say that an irresponsible person is not only negative, we say an irresponsible person is also mentally ill. A totally responsible person is mentally healthy. 
How does this affect you? Well, I know you want to advance as much as you can in life or you wouldn't be going through the efforts of taking a program like this. There is a direct relationship between the amount of responsibility you accept for the results of your organization and the amount of power, influence, position, prestige, and status you will have in your work now and in the future. At the top of the graph of responsibility, we have people who accept total responsibility and power and opportunity gravitates toward them. Down at the other end, we have no power or powerlessness until you reach the extreme example of a person who's totally irresponsible, completely out of control, who has to be constrained in a straitjacket and locked up in a padded room for their own safety and for the safety of others. Completely powerless, completely without control or freedom. Now, every time we make a decision to be self-responsible, we move up on this graph. Every time we make a decision to make excuses, we move down in this graph. So let's take it a little bit further and let's talk about the relationship between negative emotions and irresponsibility so that you understand it perfectly clearly. And a perfect example is this. Imagine here is a tree. All right? Here's a tree and here is the bushes. This is what is called the negative emotion tree. In the negative emotion tree grows the predominant negative emotions. Fear, doubt. It's, many people have considered that self-doubt is the most destructive of all negative emotion. Holds you back more than you can imagine. Also, hate is a negative emotion. Then there's envy. There's resentment. And then, of course, there's resentment sister, guilt. These are all the big negative emotions. These are the ones that have led the hit parade for years. There's about 54 different negative emotions, but these are the top one. And if you take these negative emotions and you boil them all down, and you can put in your own favorite, by the way. Everybody has their own favorite negative emotion. Jealousy could be yours. Um, Self-pity is a good, strong one. It's doing well. But if you boil it down, you find that all negative emotions eventually boil down to anger. Either inwardly expressed, that is where you make yourself sick, or outwardly expressed, that is where you make other people sick. Uh, and this negative emotion tree, if we just take a look at its structure, we find the negative emotion tree has a root system. Now, the root system is where the nutrients come from that keep the negative emotion growing and keep the fruit of the negative emotion growing and blossoming. We look at the root system, we say, what are the nutrients? What keeps negative emotions going? What are the fertilizer? What is it that you heap on the fire, if you like, or put into the ground? We find that there's two things essential to keep negative emotions alive. The first is justification. Justification. That's, that's, that's merely telling yourself and anybody else who will listen why you are justified in having this emotion. And the other is what we call identification. Identification means taking things personally. That's why, of course, they suggest that a person who acts as their own lawyer has a fool for a client. Probably a person who acts as their own doctor has a, has a fool for a patient, too. Because we become so personally identified with our own situation, and so do you, we take it so personally that we get all emotionally involved and wrapped up in it. So we find that it's not possible for you to be negative about anything for very long unless you can justify or have a reason for it and explain it to other people or unless you can identify and take it personally. For instance, if somebody comes in from the parking lot and says, they just ran into a car in the parking lot, it doesn't bother you at all because you don't identify with it. Now, if they said they just ran into a car in the parking lot and it's your car in the parking lot and the person's gone, now you can become extremely upset. Remember this, however, that we always choose these responses. I'll come back to this in a second. So how do we get rid of justification? How do we starve the root system of the negative emotion tree? The way that we get rid of justification is by becoming non-judgmental. In the Bible, it says, judge not that she be not judged. And since the Bible is, amongst many other things, a book of philosophy and metaphysics and how to live, being non-judgmental means that you just refrain from judging. Hold back from judging. Instead of casting a judgment that somebody is guilty of something, somebody has done something, just remain open and neutral. Just remaining neutral, and that's the key, stops the negative emotion from getting going. One of the things that we know about negative emotions, and I've studied them for years, is that negative emotions start off like a spark. And as they are fed, as we dwell upon them, as we justify them, as we become judgmental about the situation, they start to grow and grow and grow until they absolutely consume our minds. Now, with regard to identification, which is taking things personally, what we do is what is called we disidentify. 
we objectify or we again remain neutral. We try to keep it at arm's length. We say there is a problem, but I am not the problem. There is a difficulty, but the difficulty is not me, and we keep it at arm's length. So these two, once we begin to stop justifying and stop identifying or taking things personally, stop getting emotionally involved. Have you ever had the situation where somebody comes to you with a problem and you get so emotionally involved with their problem that you, lose, that, that you start to feel upset and they go away and they don't have a problem anymore and you're, you're still there and you're upset? This is because we've taken it so personally. However, the key to getting rid of negative emotions, and this is the most important part of this, is the trunk. It's cutting down the trunk of the negative emotion tree. And the trunk of the negative emotion tree is blame. Blame is 99% of negative emotions. Now, it's very important to understand where negative emotions come from. Negative emotions come from inside you. Negative emotions are not contained in external situations. Negative emotions are not caused by other people or other situations. Negative emotions are caused by your response to other situations. Perfect example. Two people meet the same situation, a traffic jam, a rude waiter, whatever it happens to be, and one person gets all upset and uptight and angry, the other person lets it go off their back. Another example, the same person, two different days. One day they've had an argument or a flat tire or they're late for work, they get into a traffic jam and they're angry and they're uptight. The next day, they leave with plenty of time, they had a lovely breakfast with their family, they got lots of time to get to work, they have a traffic jam, it doesn't bother them at all. In both cases, it's an example of that the negative emotion does not come from the situation. Is that you are always free to choose the quality of your emotional life. Is that you choose to become angry. Now understand this, nobody makes you feel anything. Nobody makes you feel angry. Nobody makes you feel tense. Nobody makes you feel upset. You always decide how you're going to feel, and then if you're not careful, you will fall into a negative habit pattern of blaming the other person. Blame is the core of all negative emotions. When you stop blaming, you cut down the negative emotion tree. You cut it off, you kill it, and all the negative emotions die simultaneously. It's almost exactly as if this negative emotion tree were a Christmas tree and it were plugged into the wall and the negative emotions were Christmas tree lights. And you took this plug and you jerked it out of the wall, what would happen? Well, what would happen is that all the negative emotions, the lights, would go out simultaneously, just like that. How do you do this? You do this by using the law of substitution. Remember, the law of substitution says that the conscious mind can only hold one thought at a time. It's the thought that the conscious mind holds that determines how the emotions will react, how the subconscious mind will react. Since it can only hold one thought at a time, what you do is you knock out the thought that is causing the negative emotion, the blame thought, and you replace it with this affirmation. I am responsible. I am responsible. I am responsible. This, in conjunction with I like myself, I am responsible is the most powerful positive affirmation you can use because the instant that you say I am responsible you exert complete control over your emotional life the instant you say I am responsible suddenly you are back in the driver's seat you cannot say I am responsible and feel a negative emotion simultaneously the one knocks the other one out of your conscious mind and you can start off a, for instance each one of us has a situation that causes us a lot of aggravation you have a situation it may be a person but every time you think about it you get angry every time you think about it you get cross or you get distracted what you do is whenever you start to think about that situation neutralize it by saying I am responsible wait a minute I am responsible is it a relationship who got yourself into the relationship did somebody put you there at gunpoint or did you get into it by yourself is it a job is it an investment is it a, uh, a health problem of some kind in every case accept responsibility now there's a big difference between acceptance responsibility let me just write this up it's responsibility versus blame Responsibility versus blame. What is, what is blame? Blame always looks backward toward the past. Blame looks toward the past, toward what cannot be done, toward what can't be changed. Responsibility always looks to the future. So people say, well, when you accept responsibility, isn't it the same as saying you're to blame? No. It's the same as saying that you are in charge of the quality of your thinking from this moment onward. So let us say that you come out to the parking lot and somebody's run into your car. 
Now, you have two choices. You can become angry and upset and run around and scream and shout, or you can act in a responsible manner. You can do everything possible to trace the culprit. And other than that, you can live with it maturely. So responsibility always looks to the future. Responsibility always asks this question when faced with a problem. What can we do? Not who did it, but what can we do from here? Where do we go from here? What can we do? This is the question of the responsible person. We don't cry over spilt milk. We just say, all right, what's the solution? And we get on with the game. The irresponsible person always says, who did it? and is obsessed with finding out who did it and then taking whatever blame there is and apportioning it so that everybody gets their fair share of the blame, which of course does nothing to resolve the difficulty. So the key to cutting down the negative emotion tree is using the acts and eliminating blaming. The day that you begin to eliminate blaming from your life is the day that your life starts to take off. Because the day that you start to eliminate blaming and negative emotions, suddenly most of the problems, most of the things that stand between you and the happiness you desire, vanish. Why am I making such an emphasis on negative emotions? Well, let me make that clear for just a second. What I found, and this is what was staggering to me, because I've always been committed to realizing my potential as a human being, is that you cannot advance in life except to the degree to which you get rid of your negative emotions. You cannot make any progress. You cannot go any further than where you are right this minute except to the degree to which you leave your negative emotions behind. Now, by the way, with regard to the negative emotion that you have that's associated with another person or situation, it's difficult to accept responsibility. It's difficult to say, I am responsible initially because you've been blaming that person for so long. So sometimes you have to say it with gritted teeth. You have to say, well, I am responsible. I am responsible. But the more you repeat this, I am responsible, I am responsible, I am responsible, it comes easier and easier. Eventually it gets to the point where as soon as you think of that person or situation, you can neutralize the thought by the law of substitution by saying, wait a minute, I am responsible. I am responsible. There's a beautiful line that you can use also in dealing with difficult people that goes back to self-esteem, and it also has to do with eliminating negative emotions, is say something like this, no matter what you say or do, I'm still a valuable and worthwhile person. Or, no matter what happens, I am still a valuable and worthwhile person. Or no matter how this situation turns out, I am still a valuable and worthwhile person. The natural course of life is this. Here's the road of life. And when we're children, we start off with no negative emotions. All negative emotions, by the way, have to be taught to a child. They have to be taught and the child has to learn them from their parents. Have you ever seen a negative baby? There's no such thing as a negative baby. Babies just laugh and they're happy and they cry when they have needs, but babies are not negative. But as we grow up, we watch the people around us and we begin to develop our own negative emotions, which we carry in a sack on our back. As we become teenagers, our, this sack grows big enough to the point where we can even go to slumber parties or we can get together with our buddies and we can talk about how terrible our ch childhood has been, how rotten our parents are, how rotten our siblings, teachers, and everything else are. Now when we become adults, what is the mark of adulthood in our society? The mark of adulthood is that you have a great gunny sack full of negative emotions because you have suffered. And what happens is you spend most of your time when you're with other people letting down your guards and telling them about how much you've suffered. What you do is you uh, use exchanges of negative emotions as the basis for your relationships. You say, look, I'll show you my negative emotions if you'll show me yours. Remember like we used to do as kids? And what you do is you get together like a couple of traitors in an Arab bazaar and you display your negative emotions. You say, oh, look at this rotten childhood I had. And look at this terrible relationship. And look at how crummy my boss is and how rotten this is and so on. And you exchange them back and forth. Now what happens when you talk about and think about your negative emotions? Remember the law of concentration? Whatever you dwell upon grows. Whatever you dwell upon grows and gains strength and stays alive. Negative emotions, by the way, and this is another thing that I learned in the study, is negative emotions are very fragile and ephemeral things. Is that if you don't keep them alive through constant talking, through constant cultivation, you know what happens? They die on you. Yes. You see, negative emotions just die. It's like a fire. If it falls where there's nothing, or a spark, if it falls where there's nothing to burn, it goes out. Negative emotions, unless you talk about them and keep them going, unless you dwell on them all the time, they die on you. Have you ever had an experience where you're really worried about something, you're really upset about something, and it's preoccupying all of your time, and 
And then you get to work or you get home and you get so busy doing something else that for about three or four hours you don't have time to think of anything else. And about three or four hours you stop and say, geez, I haven't worried about that for a long time. I've got to get back to worrying about it because what's happening is going out. It's like a fire that's going out. So you've got to get back to it. You've got to think about it and talk about it and worry about it and hassle it to get it back up to the point where it's preoccupying your whole mind. How many times does that happen? Well, what the mature adult does is the mature adult leaves their negative emotions by the side of the road and gets on with the rest of their life. They get on with the rest of their lives. They leave them there instead of dragging them along. They leave them like a big pile of garbage at a garbage strike. They just leave it there. And when people say, how are things going? You say, wonderful. You say, how's life? You say, terrific. You say, how's your relationships? Couldn't be better. How is your health? How are you feeling? I feel great. In other words, don't talk about negative things because when you talk about negative things, you actually increase them and you draw more of them into your life. Look at the people that you know who have problems. You notice the people that you know who have problems all the time, never seem to solve their problems? Are people who talk about their problems all the time? To him that has shall more be given. From him who hath not even that which he has shall be taken away. Now, this is another critical point with regard to relationships. And I learned this again in my studies. It is that each of us has a certain amount of suffering that we've gone through and people fall in love with their suffering. People love their suffering. As a matter of fact, they feel that they've paid for it, they've thought about it, they've lived with it for so long that most people are very reluctant to give up their suffering. You can't talk them out of it. You say, well, why don't you just forget it? Why don't you just put it behind you? Why don't you just get on with it? They say, well, I can't do that. Do you know how much I've suffered? Do you know how much emotional investment I've put into this relationship, this job, this career, and so on? I remember, oh, well, I, can't, I can tell you, a thousand people have come up to me who are in bad relationships. And they say, well, I've been in this relationship or in this marriage now for several years. And I'm miserable. I'm unhappy. We don't like each other. It's going nowhere. I say, why don't you do something about it? But after all these years? And what I say to them is I say, look, the average life expectancy of the average American today is between 75 and 80 years. And it's going up. By the time we reach the end of the century, the average life expectancy would probably be 80, 85, 90 years old. Do you know what that means? That whatever age you are now, and you may be 20, 25, 30, 35, it doesn't really matter, you subtract that from 80, you get the number of years that you've got left to live in this current situation. You ask yourself, do you want to live in this situation for the next 30, 40, 50 years? And the answer, the answer, in all honesty, has to be no, because it's probably not going to get any better. People love their suffering. They hate to give up their suffering. So what we've devised is a very simple bit of advice. And this advice, I just recently discussed this with a consulting psychologist, and he said it's the simplest advice he's ever heard to give to people who need it. It's when somebody comes up to you and wants to talk to you about their problems. You say yes, and you be sympathetic and empathetic. It's very good to hear people and let them talk about their problems, except there are some people who do nothing but talk about their problems. Every time you see them, they talk about their problems. Very often, they talk about the same things they talked about last time. What you do is you say, yes, I hear what you say, and I'm, I'm very sympathetic. However, you're responsible for your own life, you are responsible. What are you going to do about it? You are responsible for your own life. What are you going to do about it? Now, what will happen is this, is that your good friends will say, yes, you're right, I am responsible. I have to make a change. I have to do something about it. And they'll go out and they'll do it. As a matter of fact, they'll come and they'll lay out all their problems to you. And all you say to them is this. You say, well, what do you think you should do about it? Now, your good friends can use that conversational time to get their own thoughts in line, to come up with their own conclusions and go out, and they don't need your advice. Most people don't need advice. There's an old saying that says that, don't worry about the universal propensity to give advice because the propensity to ignore it is equally universal. People don't need advice sometimes, they just need a sounding board. However, there are some people who don't have any intentions of doing anything about their problems. All they want to do is they want to use their problems as an excuse to get you to talk about them. You understand that? The very common neurotic tendency in our society is to use your problems as the basis for the discussion. Here's my problems. Let's you and me talk about them. And the person in himself or herself has no interest in you at all. All they have an interest in is having you listen. As a matter of fact, we say this as a, as, as a joke. We say that this is what these people look like. Is these people look upon you as being a person, and this is your face, and this is your eyes, and these are your ears. See? And here is your eyes, preferably wide open and sympathetic. Here's your mouth, preferably shut. And here's your ears, preferably wide open. These people don't even look upon you as a person. They don't care about your problems at all. All they care about is you sitting there listening and nodding sympathetically 
and giving them advice which they have no intention whatever of following. When you run into people like this, it's a very simple way to test the friendship. Just start talking about yourself. Say, well, you know, I'm really glad you brought your problems to me because I've got some problems of my own and I'd like to discuss my life with you. You will find these people will run for the door. They'll watch their watch. They've got an appointment. They'll take off so fast you can't imagine. All right, now one final point, and this is critical. It's absolutely critical to the whole subject. It's the wrap-up point, if you like. It's this. Is that when we start talking about giving up negative emotions, almost everybody says, yes, I agree. What you say is true. It makes sense to me, Brian, and I am going to give up my negative emotions. I am going to accept responsibility. I am going to take charge of my life, and I'm not going to blame anybody else anymore. Except for one. Everybody has one that they're not going to part with. Everybody has that favorite negative emotion that they've been paying for and holding on to for years. Now, let me tell you why it's so important that you give it up. Here's a car. Imagine it's a beautiful Mercedes automobile. Brand new from the factory, absolutely spitting 560 SEL, $55,000, beautiful vehicle, tested in every aspect, absolutely perfect. It's given to you without a flaw, except for one. This is the front of the automobile, and there's one small problem, is that for some mechanical reason, this brake is locked on. Now, you get into this beautiful Mercedes, just as you are, beautiful mind, beautiful body, beautiful potential, incredible capability. You get into this beautiful Mercedes and you start it up and you step on the gas. And what happens? Well, if the front brake is locked on, what will happen to the car? No matter how hard you step on the gas, what will happen to the car? What will happen is that the car will spin. It'll go around in circles. It'll spin and it will go around in circles until you stop stepping on the gas and you give up. As long as that front brake is locked on, you can't go anywhere. What I found was this, is that the existence of just one negative emotion that you will not let go of for whatever reason, and the reason is always an ego reason, the reason is always has to do with your own ego, will cause you to stay in the same place and spin your wheels and go in circles for the rest of your life. That you all know people who are talented, who have opportunities, good educations, and so on and so forth, and their life just goes around in circles. They just seem to be spinning. They've got everything going for them, and they just continually have problems. Why is it? Almost invariably, and this is what all psychoanalysis does, all psychotherapy, is they've got one negative emotion locked on, and the negative emotion they have locked on is blame. There is somebody that they are still blaming for something. There's somebody that they are not going to let off the hook because that son of a gun did something to them. You know what I'm talking about? You know what I'm talking about because we're all in the same boat. We're all human beings. The reason this makes sense to you and I is because we do have a tendency to fall in love with our suffering. We do have a tendency to gunny sack and to think that part of our humanity is all these negative emotions. We do have a tendency to see that other people are responsible. Other people have hurt us. They did cost us money. They did uh, hurt us in a relationship. But the key to peak performance, the key to happiness, the key to success is to use the law of substitution and knock those negative emotions out of the box by the very first time you think of anything that causes you any stress, you say, I am responsible. Wait a minute, I am responsible. I am responsible. I am responsible. I like myself and I am responsible. I like myself and I am responsible. And nothing outside of me is going to disrupt my peace of mind. I am in charge of my emotional life. I am responsible. You are responsible. This is the end of side one. Please fast forward to the end to queue up side two for your listening.